So the first question is, how did you become interested in gerontology? Uh, that's an interesting question. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually trained in child psychiatry and social work. Mm -hmm. And I, my first job, I worked with rural, depressed young mothers in Connecticut. And uh, I, my job was to keep them from recycling out of the state hospital. And I, at the time, I was pregnant with my second child. I had a small child at home. And I convinced myself that there was little we could offer that these rural, depressed mothers that was better than a 10-day state hospital stay. <laughs> And in the process of dealing with them and their children and all their family problems, I realized that I wanted my work life to be different from my home life. So the next job I took was the opposite end of the spectrum. It was working in a nursing home. And um, that's how I sort of fell into gerontology. I had no social work training in gerontology because it wasn't it was barely offered at the time. So this was post your training? Right. It was right after my master's degree I did um, work with young families mm -hmm. because I had taken my um, field work had all been in child psychiatry and uh, working with juvenile delinquents, the other end of the age <laughs> spectrum. Uh, but then once I changed I never went back and that's over 40 years ago. So. Great. Um, so how would you describe your trajectory as a gerontologist, career-wise? Uh, there was no plan. It was totally serendipitous. Um, the first thing I did is I worked on after nursing homes. Uh, I did spend some time developing a program in a home for the agent that was a really powerful and meaningful experience because I had a peer who also hadn't been trained in aging, but was trained in group work. And she and I was trained in individual work. And she and I developed an entire program for Home for the Aged, group and individual. And we trained each other to do different um, aspects of our job. But we created a real community and a real successful program. Then I went on to another city, and I developed a program with the old War on Poverty, and it was a downtown storefront advocacy organization for older people. And I worked with volunteer programs, protective services, um, entitlement programs, and I worked with older volunteers, uh, training them to go door to door for isolated older people. And from that, I got my first teaching job in a bachelor's in social work program where they wanted me to teach all aging courses. And having had no experience, I went to the literature. I found um, everything that was written about how to teach aging seemed to come from this place called Duke. And um, <coughs> I had um, always thought of Duke, the Center for Aging, as Mecca because that's where I got all my resources for teaching. And then when my husband was offered a position in North Carolina in Chapel Hill, um, I said, well, I'm going to work at Duke, not having a clue that you don't just walk into a major academic institution and say, I'm here, you know. Um, so it took me six months in North Carolina to convince George Maddox, who was the director of the Aging Center at Duke at the time, um, to hire me to work on a federal grant that they had as a data tech with a master's degree, $6 an hour, part-time, no benefits. And he said, I will rue the day that I hire somebody who's overqualified for this job. And I said, I just want to get in here and see what you all are doing. And um, within nine months, I had written myself into a gr another grant. And um, in another year, I had developed my own program. And I so appreciate those serendipitous opportunities that I'm not sure are around anymore. And at what point in that trajectory did you embrace being a gerontologist and start describing yourself as such? 
I primarily describe myself as a social worker because I've always been in gerontological settings and I want to be, I want people to know about my discipline. But I started saying I was an agent from the 1972 when I got a job in the first home for the agent. Um, I always said that was my specialty. And I always identified with people in gerontology. But in introducing myself at first, I would say I'm a social worker in aging because I wanted the discipline to be recognized as having a major role in gerontology. Mm -hmm. um, and did you have any female mentors who sort of impacted your move into gerontology? Uh, yes. There was one in particular, Elaine Brody, who just died this summer. Uh, she was a social worker at the Philadelphia Geriatric Center. And in my first nursing home job, that, she was writing the only materials for social work in long-term care. And was writing some of the best materials. She wrote a textbook that I have dog-eared. And then when I got to Duke, I actually got to meet her. And the pivotal event for me was my first Gerontological Society of America meeting. And what she was, was 1980. She was the president of the Gerontological Society. She had a master's in social work. I had a master's in social work. And I went to the opening ceremony, and she was funny. <laughs> And she was so real and natural, and I said, I want to be her. And if there was ever a plan, I think it was that I modeled myself after her, and I got to know her very well over my career. I spent, I talked with her at least once a year at gerontological society meetings, and she used to love to tease me and say, Lisa, I'm the last person who can get away with a master's degree. You've got to go for a doctorate. And so at one point in my career, I did look at those opportunities. And I decided I liked being a square peg in a round hole. <laughs> and I was going to do it my way, just like she did. And um, I think she was probably, within my discipline, the major uh, role model for me. And she's an awesome role model. Picked a good one. Yeah, I picked a real good one. <laughs> and I went to her last talk at GSA. Um, she gave an award talk a few years ago. And her granddaughter, who's a social worker, was there. And it was written up in the gerontologist. She was fabulous. She was, must have been, Oh, late 80s at the time. But she talked about aging from a personal perspective. And she was every bit a gerontologist and a woman experiencing it on a personal level. And I thought she that was one of the best talks I ever heard. And it was really inspiring. Absolutely. Um, what do you think is unique about being a woman gerontologist? I don't think it's all that unique. Um, one of the things I think that's been important to me is to recognize that even though I'm a woman in gerontology and I think I've been a leader and I've had wonderful opportunities, a lot of my major mentors have been men. And one of the reasons is gerontology is a field where I feel men have always treated women better than in any other field and that's one of the reasons I love it so much. Um, so, I don't feel it's particularly unique to be a woman in gerontology. So you said that you thought a lot of the leadership positions sort of went to men. Why do you think that is? The leadership positions <clears throat> do go to men because men tend, of my era, and I'm a lot older than most of the people you're interviewing, <laughs> uh, the men of my era tended to go straight through. I got a late start in terms of being in gerontology in academic setting. I wasn't until my 30s that I was a Duke, mid-30s, and uh, yet I've had 36 years there. I think that um, 
I think I had more barriers to leadership because of the lack of the doctorate than I actually did because I was a woman. I knew that going in, and I accepted that. And when it came down to it, Elaine told me, she said, there are two things you can't do. You can't be a PI on a federal grant, and you can't be first author on an empirically based peer-reviewed journal article, research article. And I did them both. <laughs> and so I didn't really feel that I was hindered in many ways by the PhD. I did the leadership that counted for me. The one thing I wanted to do was I wanted to be president of GSA because Elaine Brody had been president of GSA. And I wanted to be the next MSW president, and I was. So that was, I got what I wanted. Without having to be yeah. an old doctor thing. Yeah, <laughs> right. So it worked out really well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And do you, do you, so do you think that the we're shifting towards women being able to have more of a leadership role? Oh, absolutely. I think now universities, particularly in academic settings, are seeking out women leaders and actually encouraging women leaders. And there's many more opportunities for training, leadership training for women than there ever was, at least at my school there is. Um, and it's, they're very encouraged. Um, so I think they're getting much more preparation for leadership. And yet when I go, I'm in the Department of Psychiatry at Duke, and when I go to psychiatry women's faculty group meetings and focus groups and support groups, I'm hearing sort of the same issues from women faculty, but there are very few social workers in that group because I'm one of two social workers on the faculty in my department in the School of Medicine. So again, I'm a square peg in a round hole. So, But I think that some of the issues are the same. Um, how has being a gerontologist interacted with your own personal aging process? That's really interesting. Um, I've been shocked, frankly, um, that nothing I knew prepared me for my own aging process or my personal responses. Um, I know a lot about grief and bereavement. I know a lot about parental loss. I know a lot about spousal loss and widowhood. And um, nothing prepared me for my own aging. I am shocked when physical things happen to me that are part of the aging process. And I went, oh yeah. And, you know, I shouldn't have been so surprised. And intellectually, you can know something, but it's a totally personal experience when it happens to you. And um, what I hope is that I retain Elaine's sense of humor. Um, she had a biting wit, but she also had a wonderful sense of humor about her own aging process and sort of reflecting and observing on her own experience, um, being in a senior living situation and talking to other people and other women her age and who weren't all necessarily academics, but well-accomplished people. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it's very different when it happens to you. Um, when I started out in gerontology and I was working with older people, um, I, I thought it was a terrific advantage because they were thrilled that a young person was so vitally interested in what they thought. And when we did research and we interviewed or did uh, clinical interventions to assist older people, they were really pleased with the attention and interest of academics who were younger and that thought this was an important area of study. Um, there's less of that when you're a peer of the people that you're studying. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was also something that took a while to get used to. Because you weren't that like. Yeah. And also now most of my clients, are, or most of the people I interact with on a semi-clinical basis, uh, the families I work with, are all younger. Um, 
that's a real different experience for me. One of the thing, reasons I chose aging was that I believed aging was the one field where you could work with the entire age spectrum and take a lifespan approach, which I believed from reading all the stuff I had read in, for teaching uh, at the bachelor's and master's level. And um, I still believe that. I believe aging offers the most opportunity to use every skill you have. I found out I was a writer. I was an innate reporter. I love to teach, but I like teaching community groups and professional groups and uh, civic organizations. And I could do anything I wanted in aging. Um, and I thought it offered the most flexibility and the most range. Um, and so I really loved it. Okay. Still love it. Still love it. Okay. <laughs> Shouldn't say past tense. Yeah, you're still doing it. <laughs> yeah. um, so the WIGL project focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists. Um, so within that framework, is there anything else you'd like us to know? I think that women in gerontology have been real trailblazers. And I think they've been trailblazers in that they were very smart very productive, they ask the important practical so what questions, and um, they left a legacy of research literature, but also very practical products for people experiencing aging and aging related issues. Um, and I think women in gerontology probably had a major effect on the current um, emphasis on interprofessional education. And that's sort of where I am right now, and where I've really been all along. But we used to call it interdisciplinary, and now it's interprofessional. Um, but I think it's equally important. And I think women have been at the forefront of saying, this is the only way to go in aging services and in aging research. Okay, um, and then I had one question. You should ask this one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, um, so you've had this like incredibly long trajectory in career. Mm -hmm. So what is one piece of advice you would offer for somebody like me who's sort of just getting started that's like something you wish you'd known at the beginning? That, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think what I wish I would have known is that there an incredible number of opportunities out there and that if you're in a doctoral program you're forced forced to focus and narrow your scope to get through your doctoral research but after that I think you should treat it as the world's your oyster and always be looking for the next thing that really seems exciting to you it may not be the hot thing or the you know, politically correct buzzword of the time. But one of the things that I love about gerontology is that when you go to a meeting like this, you hear things you've never thought about, but you have these aha moments. And if you have the opportunity to pursue some of those aha moments and to go after the people that really inspire you and say, how can I do this? with what I have in preparation and where I am in my career, I think they'll help you. Um, people in gerontology are incredibly generous and incredibly open to letting others coming up in the field try new things.